The sermon is coming up, but first, here are the announcements. The next Food Finders event will be on Tuesday, January 16th, and we are in need of some volunteers to help hand out food and serve the community. If you would like to help out, please meet right here at FCF at 1030 a.m. on January 16th. If you are new here, we want to encourage you to fill out a connection card so that we can get to know you a little better. On the back of the seat that is in front of you, you will find that connection card. Take out that card, fill it out, and turn it into the Welcome Center in exchange for a free gift. As always, we want to thank you for your faithful giving here at FCF. As a reminder, there are drop boxes on each side of the sanctuaries, but if you are looking for an alternative method, you can give online or use the FCF app. To give online, visit our website at fcfnow.org and click on the Give link in the menu. For the app, simply scroll down and tap on the Give graphic. If you made a decision for Jesus, the next step is baptism. If you're ready for that next step, we will be having more baptisms soon and would love to get you baptized as well. We encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center to get signed up. Again, we're not rushing anything, but sooner or later, all these wonderful Christmas decorations that you see around here need to be taken down and stored away. If you would like to help out, please see the sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. RevFit classes will be starting up on Friday, January 12th. There's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center, and Jen Reese will be sharing more information soon. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then, one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight-note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses? She said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. And that's when I realized the good news she was talking about. everything for the announcements and now let's get to the sermon. Hey good morning everybody and Merry Christmas to you and your family. I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning because this morning as we're celebrating the epic event of Christmas and today as we're, we're really just taking a look at the greatest story that's ever been told, we're also talking about the greatest gift that has ever been given. Amen. So if you would, go ahead and find Luke chapter 2 this morning. We'll jump right in. You can look on your smartphones or maybe you brought your own Bible with you this morning. But if you're a guest here today, it's going to be up on the screen as well. So go ahead and find Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20 in its entirety 
so that we can get a, a really good look at Luke's account of these events that took place at this amazing event, which, as we all know, is the birth of Jesus. But really what my goal is and what I want to do this morning is I just want to keep it light and, and really I just want to cover the, the, the story of Jesus' birth. And, and in order to do that, I want to just take a minute to zero in and, and focus on some things that I really believe often get missed when we just rush through reading the Christmas story year after year. But they're things that nonetheless we should remember and they're things that we should keep in front of us, not just today, but, but all year long. And so today as a part of my introduction and kind of just as a lead, and I, I want to just read verses 1 through 7 as a part of this introduction to my message. And then when we get there, we're going to look primarily at verses 8 through 14 as we focus on some very important words that were spoken by the angel who was there on that day in history. And so follow along with me in Luke 2. The first seven verses retell the story of Jesus' birth. Let's read that together. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. All right, so those first seven verses in Luke chapter 2 they really do quite a bit to help us to understand what was happening on this amazing day. Because they actually set the time of the birth of, of Jesus as taking place during the first census that was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. In other words, that's an exact time period that, we can, that, that can be traced back to an actual point in time, and it can be identified as factual in documented history. And so we know the time period, don't we? But those first seven verses, they also set the location of the birth of Jesus, taking place in a real town, in Bethlehem of Judea, the, the city of David. And so we know the location, don't we? And Joseph, he was a descendant of the family of David. That's important for us to know this morning because in, in Matthew 1, verses 1 through 16, what it does is it breaks things down and gives us a, a genealogy of Jesus all the way from Abraham in that 16th, birth, or that 16th verse. It, it tells us, that he was in the line, Joseph was in the line of, of David. And so during the census, everybody, everybody, no matter what, under the Roman rule, they went to their hometown to register. Mary and Joseph, they were traveling from Nazareth in Galilee, and they were heading back to Bethlehem. And while they were there, Mary, she goes into labor, and we all know the story, right? Jesus is born. And so the place and the setting of Jesus' birth, it's in a stable because there was no room at the inn. And so a manger was used as a bed for this newborn baby. And then as we get back into our text for today, the next 13 verses, they go on and they describe the angels showing up and announcing Jesus' birth to the shepherds who were out in the nearby fields as they were watching over their flocks. And so our passage for today, it's going to show us what the reaction was to the announcement that the angels gave. We're going to see how the shepherds responded to the news that was delivered to them in such a very special way. Because they took to heart what the angel said. And they went into Bethlehem and they went and found Mary and Joseph and this newborn baby Jesus. And they were there just like they were told they'd be there. The shepherds told, when they got there, the shepherds told them about the angels. And then they left there telling other people and they were praising God for, for what they had gotten to see and, and, and the, the news that they got to hear. And so that kind of just sets that up for us this morning as we move forward. But before we leave here today, I want us to just dial in and, and to really concentrate on some very key words that the angel had said to these shepherds. And so before we read the rest of the story this morning, and, and before we move on to go celebrate with our family and continue to worship through that celebration, let's pause and pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning through the, through the word this morning. Father God, we're so grateful for this greatest gift that was ever given, Father. It's full, Jesus is full of peace and love and, and, and all good things, Father. And we're just so blessed to, to be able to be in relationship with him. Thank you for this gift. 
Today, Father, as we just shortly pause for a short time this morning, before we move on the rest of the day, we just want to pull our focus back to the birth of your son. And we just want to give you praise and honor and glory for, for allowing us to have a relationship with him and making a way for everyone to have a relationship. So, Father, in this moment, I pray that you'll remove distractions and just let quiet our hearts and our minds. And just for this time, Father, let us see what you want us to see this morning. And as always, Father, we're grateful that you, you take us right where we are, but you love us so much you don't leave us there. So, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us, show us what we need to see, and help us to respond to it. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we pick it back up at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And it goes on to say, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And so let's pause right there before we go on. I mean, can you even imagine what it would have been like if you were just out in an open field at night and you were just minding your own business and just really just focused on your work? And then out of the blue, all of a sudden, an angel appears. I mean, that would freak you out, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would freak me out. I mean, for most of us, the, the appearance of an angel, it's already a very scary thing for us to think about. Unless maybe that angel disguises themselves to blend in and, and to look just like an ordinary person. And maybe that's how we automatically think of angels when we hear about them or when we think about seeing them or encountering them. Maybe when you think about angels, you think about uh, the Hollywood angels, like uh, if you remember the TV show Highway to Heaven. How many of you remember that? Yeah, there's a few of us old enough. Or It's a Wonderful Life, Clarence, yeah? Or Touched by an Angel. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, they blended in, right? In fact, Hebrews does, it does tell us not to forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. And so we know that angels at times, they do blend in with the crowd. They often look just like you and me. But that's not always the case. Because scripture, it also points out that there's times that an angel, they definitely stand out in size. They, they stand out in appearance and they stand out in the way that they speak to us. I mean, you'll just know that they're not human. Take, for instance, the description of the angel from Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. It says, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. And so what we're reading about this morning in the Christmas story, it's not an angel that blends in, but an angel that stands out. An angel that looks different and it immediately grabs your attention. And the scripture said, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And very understandably, as, as we look at the story, the, the shepherds were afraid, right? They were afraid when the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to them and, and the glory of the Lord was shining about him. I think that any one of us sitting here this morning would absolutely be terrified in that moment. The angel actually had to calm the shepherds down, if you, if you read into the story, which, which he did by telling them not to be afraid because he had some good news for them. I mean, if an angel has to tell you not to be afraid then that's definitely, that definitely means that you're afraid, amen? You're definitely showing some evidence that you're afraid. But the text actually says it was more than that. The text says that they were terrified. But you know something? Their fear wasn't the issue. Because the angel goes on and he, he lets them know that he isn't there to hurt them, but instead to give them some amazing news. News that's so good, news that's so wonderful and so amazing that it's being delivered by a messenger from God. In fact, God sends his own personal messenger to, to share good news, but, but it was news that, that also had great significance, significance that would impact all of mankind for all of eternity. Because this good news was news of great joy. And it's not limited to just the shepherds who, who it was being announced to in the story. This was good news of great joy that would be for all the people, good news of great joy for you and me sitting here today. News of great joy for our loved ones who aren't here, who don't know the Lord yet. 
And now we see that the angel announces this good news as we pick up verse 11. It says, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. I mean, we love when babies are born, right? Raise your hand if you like when babies are born. You like to visit and hold them. And they're so precious and sweet and innocent, aren't they? So the birth of a child is always good news. But how is it that the birth of this child would be good news of great joy for all the people everywhere for all time? Well, I want to just take a closer look and examine the announcement of the angel so that we don't miss its significance. Because first off, it says that a Savior has been born. I mean, a general announcement that that a Savior had been born would have been good news for somebody, somewhere, right, under very specific circumstances. But that wouldn't necessarily mean that there was good news of uh, great joy for all people. Because that would depend on a Savior's purpose, right? Because by definition, a Savior is somebody that saves someone from something. And the significance of a Savior is directly related to the danger from which he saves and the means by which he saves, and the extent to which he saves. I mean, there's a difference between somebody rescuing me personally from from drowning in a lake and saving my life so I don't die, versus someone saving me along with millions of other people, 15% on my auto insurance. I mean, don't get me wrong, saving money is is, good news. But not experiencing death and, and being given a second chance, that's good news. That's good news that brings great joy. It it causes us to change the way that we live, to change the way that we think about things, but but also to change the way that we love other people, right? It changes the way we look at life. Good news and good news that bring joy are two different things. And now the angel's revealing that this isn't just any ordinary good news. Now the angel's announcing the, the arrival of the Savior, And in their minds, an undefined Savior, even one that would bring great joy to all people, it could have referred to many things. It could have referred to a great military leader like Joshua, somebody that was going to defeat evil. Or it could have referred to a great king like Solomon, one who would rule the people well, and, and they would do it with justice and equality. Or maybe a great high priest like Ezra, somebody who would teach the people the ways of God. I mean, any of those men could have been a savior to somebody's specific need, depending on what their need was. And so there had to be more information in order to identify this exact savior that the angel was announcing and the precise reason that he would bring great joy to all people. So what were the specifics that would clearly and without a doubt identify the specific savior and what he was saving them from? Well, the first identifying clue that the angel gave to the shepherds is that the Savior was born in the city of David. And that's important for us to know. It's not only a reference to the location of the the birth of this baby so that they could go and find him later on, because the location itself is highly important for an entirely different reason. But it also verifies and it confirms that it's talking about the long-awaited and the prophesied coming Messiah. You see... The shepherds, they would have immediately understood the reference of the baby being born in the city of David as meaning that the Savior was from the lineage of King David. They would have known that the arrival of this Savior was actually fulfilling the prophecy that was found in Micah 5, chapter 5, verse 2, which I want to read that to you, says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel." His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And so any doubt about who the Savior is was removed when the angel specifically said that the Savior was the Messiah, the Lord. And by the way, Messiah and Christ, are, they're the same things. They're, they're not Jesus' last name, if you were wondering. It's, it's a title that's reserved for one person and one person only. It means anointed one or the chosen one. It's his title, and it's a title that's reserved only for the Savior and the Messiah. And so this Savior was the individual that had been promised from long ago that was going to come as the Savior of Israel. And we got to understand that there was an anticipation, there, there was expectation that the Messiah would bring salvation on a lot of different levels. 
Because we should remember that at the time of this, uh, when the angel came to the shepherds in the field, the nation of Israel was under Roman control. And so the Jews, they had a great hope and a desire to see the Messiah come to save them from a political oppression that, that had been upon them to so many degrees for, for a very long time. And being a religious nation, the people, they knew that there were many prophecies that were found in the scriptures. For example, Isaiah in the ninth chapter and, and uh, Jeremiah in the 30th chapter, they, they talk about his coming and his reign and, and they cast the vision of one day having freedom and no longer being under the bondage of other nations. So many prophets along the way had already prophesied about their future deliverance as a nation, both politically and militarily. Because there was also the expectation that the coming Messiah would also bring great prosperity for Israel. You see, in their minds, they were going to be saved from poverty because the Messiah would take care of them and they would have abundance. Ezekiel and Amos, Isaiah and Joel, they all prophesied about God's protection and his provision. They prophesied about his abundance and the blessings that would be poured out on the people of Israel through the coming Messiah. And so they thought that he would come and improve them financially and materialistically. There was also an expectation that the coming of the Messiah would bring justice and world peace with Jerusalem at the center of it all, like Isaiah and Zechariah and even the Psalms foretold. But the coming Savior who, who was announced by the angel in our story would be so much more than that. He would be the Savior from sin. Church, he's a spiritual Savior. This is what the angel meant, that this child born in the city of David was the Savior that would bring great joy to all the people. See, the prophecy in Isaiah 53, it's the most detailed, but, but the promise actually goes all the way back to a prophecy found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 that there would come from the seed of the woman, one who would crush the serpent's head. It's the promise given to Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. In other words, there would be someone in the future that would be able to deal with the curse of sin once and for all. And then in Isaiah 52, all the way into, uh, from verse 13 all the way into chapter 53, it describes the suffering servant of God that would be despised and forsaken by men, one who would be oppressed and crushed, and he would be poured out in death as a sacrifice for sin. Let's pick it up and read that. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6 says this. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then we skip down to verses 11 and 12 and listen to what it adds. It says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Church, this was the purpose of the coming Jesus. God with us, God in the flesh, this Messiah we're talking about. This is who we're celebrating on Christmas. And you and I, have ne we must never, ever forget that. Because Jesus dying for our sins and the sins of all mankind is the central purpose of his coming. That's what the angel told Joseph. In fact, you might remember that Joseph, he found out that Mary was pregnant and he didn't believe her. He was going to actually break things off with her and put her away privately until the angel intervened. I mean, look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. You see that this baby would be given a name that reflected his purpose. And the name Jesus, it actually means Yahweh is the Savior. The entire purpose of the Messiah coming was to redeem mankind from our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled with our God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus was born without a human father so that he wasn't under Adam's curse. 
And even though he was tempted in every single way, just like any human was, he was still without sin, like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 tells us. And then he willingly gave his life as the payment for sin by his death on the cross. And his resurrection from the dead, it proved his claims about himself, that, that the sacrifice had been accepted and that, that his promises were true. And so Jesus and Jesus alone can forgive our sins and give us eternal life and to give eternal life to anyone who will believe and follow after him. That's the hope we have through this baby that we're celebrating. That's the good news that no other news could ever match. It's the cause of great joy for all the people everywhere from every tongue and tribe and nation in our neighborhoods and in our families and all the way around the world. It's for all men. And so Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. And now we see that the angel announced to the shepherds that he's also the Lord. One last thing that the angel said to the shepherds on that night that we need to point out and remember about this baby who was born in the city of David is that he's the Savior who is the Messiah, but he's also the Lord. And, and we all know what that is, right? We call him Lord all the time when we talk to him or when we talk about him. But let us today and tomorrow and every day moving forward realize, that we're, realize what we're really saying when we say that. Because the term Lord isn't only used as a title of respect, a lot like addressing somebody as sir. And it's true that the, uh, that's the way that the woman at the well used it in John 4 when she first met Jesus. But the term Lord is also used as something that's much more serious than a way to address somebody out of respect. And it's a title that's only fitting for God. Because when the term Lord is combined with the title of Christ, like the angel introduced the baby, it's a reference to the deity of the Messiah. It's declaring that this baby is God in the flesh. And that's why Matthew 1.23 says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You hear that? This baby that we're celebrating is God come down from heaven and dwelled among us. The most high God who humbled himself and he stepped out of all of the majesty and all the splendor of heaven. He walked through this life and he was tempted and he went through trials, but yet he remained sinless. And he willingly gave up his own life for our sins so that you and I can know him personally. And so that we could have an abundant life while we're living here on planet earth. And one day we're going to be with him forever. Amen. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. And he is the Lord. And then we come to verses 12 through 14 as we get back to the Christmas story. And here we see that the angel provides a confirmation by telling them what they were going to find when they got there. It says this. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a what? Manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I mean, think about it. It would be normal to wrap a baby in cloths and to keep him warm and comfortable. Any parent in here would do that, am I right? But what was unusual was finding a baby in a manger, using a manger as a bed. Because I don't know if you know this or not. We look at that, it looks like it was built to be a cradle, doesn't it? But that's not what it was. A manger is a feeding trough for an animal. A dirty feeding trough that animals eat out of. And so this was going to be the evidence to them that the angel was telling them the truth and that this was a revelation from God himself. All of this was confirmed with a multitude of these heavenly hosts and all these other angels that suddenly appeared and, and they began to praise God. And the declaration by this host of angels was fitting and the shepherds, they would have understood its implications. Because even the shepherds were trained in the Hebrew scriptures and, and they would have known that this was a reference to the Messiah because the prophet Isaiah had said, for a, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And so the Messiah who we're celebrating would be the Prince of Peace, and he would bring peace. And then finally, as I close and the worship team comes forward, I just want to end by reading the final six verses of our story before we part ways. Read with me, starting at verse 15. 
if it's up there. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So as we leave this place and we go to be with our families and to move on and to continue our celebration, I just want to charge you to go and be just like these shepherds. And in our own words and in our own actions, let's go and glorify and praise our God because this baby came to be our Savior and our Messiah and our Lord. And let's do it not only in the Christmas season, but each and every day of our lives, everywhere that we go, proclaiming the name of Jesus to the world in our words and our actions. Amen. So as the worship team plays, this is just to, let's celebrate who Jesus is. Let's celebrate that this baby was born and God gave us the greatest gift forever. And I just pray that as you go with your families this morning and you can continue celebrating and be a light and and just go from this place and just carry on the celebration for the next 365 days until we do it again. Because our God is good and he gave us a great gift. Amen. So as the worship team plays.
What a glorious night, Lord God. We thank you so much for your son, Lord God. As we spend time with our families, Lord, and reflect on that time, Lord, I just ask your blessing on each one, Lord, and that we would truly accept your son, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas.